Proverbs 13. We're going to begin reading. Actually, we're only going to read one verse today. We're going to read verse number 22. The Bible says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Now, you all know that I like the book of Proverbs. I like Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon's a little bit too poetic for me. I know, too mainly for poetry. I'm kidding. That's a joke. But I like the book of Proverbs because you can chew on verses in Proverbs for a while. You can think about it, and you can keep thinking about it, and the Holy Ghost can just show you one thing after another. A lot of times the verse doesn't change context. What happens is you start comparing that verse to other portions of the Bible, and it just adds more context to that verse. Now, verse number 22, we're going to play the teen's favorite game, the definition game. Right? Verse number two, or 22, it says, a good man. Well, the Bible tells us that there's none that is good, no, not one. Well, in context, this is not talking about a sinless man. Okay? Yes, it is true that there is none that is sinless in and of themselves except for Christ. That's why Christ had to come and become our propitiation for sin. In this context, it's not talking about sinless. It's talking about a righteous man. Someone who has, in the previous 13 chapters of the book of Proverbs... Right, understood and submitted to the fact that there is no righteousness in and of ourselves. The only righteousness we have is by following what God has instructed and commanded us to do. Okay, we can do good, but not because we figured out what good was, but because God informed us of what his standards were. And we said, by the best of our ability, with all the strength that we have, we're going to do and pursue what God wants us to do. This verse, the word good, does not just mean somebody that's going out to be righteous. It means perfect. Now you say, but Brother Jordan, you just said that good means sinless. No. Perfect does not mean sinless. Go read the book of Job. Very first chapter. Okay, it says that Job was a perfect man an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. Perfect means complete, meaning you're not missing any pieces. Okay, a lot of us drove in on cars that are very nice and the Lord has blessed us, but I remember, myself included, sometimes people drive in and their car wasn't perfect. It had pieces missing. Right? It wasn't complete. Now, was it the nicest car in the neighborhood? No, but... A perfect car means it's reliable. It's going to get you from A to B. You don't have to worry about something falling off if you get over 55 on the interstate because you're missing one of the sway bars and it starts shaking and you feel like you're in a blender. Ask Christian about that. He had a, a situation with that one time. He also had a car one time where he stepped on the brakes and the brakes didn't apply. The brake lines got blown. Yeah, that was a fun day. He drove home with the parking brake, the emergency brake. Anyway. Yeah, luckily I was nowhere around when that happened. But perfect means that it's reliable, it is dependable, it is complete. Okay, I don't know about you. I don't go around putting my stuff on the shelves that aren't 100% built yet. It's not complete. It may get the job done, but it's not the way that I would have done it. It's not the way that I expect it. A complete individual, a good man, is one that is not just assumed to be reliable, has been proven to be reliable, dependable. Someone who has a track record of it, doesn't matter what we throw at him, he can handle it. That's why God in the book of Job says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? God knew that Job wouldn't fail. God knew that Job wouldn't crack under temptation. Why? Because he knew that Job was complete or perfect. There wasn't anything missing to his faith. There wasn't a piece of the puzzle that he didn't have that would result in his failure. 
Now, was Job the prettiest puzzle once all the pieces got put together? I would say no. Because you find out that people didn't hang around Job because of who Job was. They hung around Job because of what Job had. After the Lord delivered everything that he had ever blessed Job with into the hands of Satan, you find that there's only three fellows that show up. After all the times that Job was there for everybody else, Job was still a good man. Job still had the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the Lord, but yet the princes didn't come down and ask him. People didn't have faith in Job. They had faith in Job's success. And when Job's success was gone, they thought that Job's goodness was gone. Well, verse number 22 says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Well, we've already mentioned Job. Let's stay with Job. People thought Job was a failure. And they thought because he had failed, he could no longer be good. The two are not related. You have your spiritual standing, and then you have the world's perception of you. The two are not linked. You know why? Because spiritually... Man looketh on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. The world only has carnal eyes to see what it is that's on the inside. And what's on the outside doesn't match what God put into you. If you don't believe me, that's why one of these days when the rapture happens, or if you go through the grave, one of these days we're going to hear come up hither, Amen. and there's going to be a great wardrobe change. You know why? Because what God put on the inside of you deserves better than what we're stuck in right now. We're going to get a wardrobe change because he wants the outside of you to match the inside of you. But right now, this thing called flesh is still cursed by sin. Right? We look like we're made of the same stuff as the world because we are. We were born into the same world. We were conceived the same way. Right? Ain't nobody in here, okay, that was a clone that was grown in a lab. Okay? Nobody in here had anything else for the birth process except C-section or you came through the womb the womb of a woman right, there's, we're all the same stuff yeah, yeah some of us got genetic mutations that cause hair to be red don't know where that happened don't know how it happened Okay, some of us got the genes to be tall some of us got the genes to be short but if you boil it all down to what we're made out of it's just four and really they get paired up into two different pairs sets of Lego blocks that if you spin them together and combine them enough, you get a thing called DNA. We're all made of the same stuff. Now, we may have been assembled in different places all around the world, but you find out wherever you go, people are people. Right? There are things in the world that you can look at and say, wow, that's impressive, or wow, I can't believe that they accomplished that. There are things that please the carnal eyes, but the carnal eyes are never satisfied. That's why when Job lost everything, people didn't remember how successful Job was. They just saw how unsuccessful Job is at that moment. The world thinks that failure is a bad thing. Now, keep in mind, this is coming from a guy who spent over a decade of his life on the weekends chasing these things called trophies because I like being number one and everybody else not. Okay? This is coming from a guy who thinks that failure means that I did something wrong. Okay? Because in the, this may sound conceited, but it's the truth. I knew that if I lost, it wasn't because the other person was better. It was because I messed up. I got no problem getting the tar beat out of me by somebody who's better than me. Okay? Now, on the football field, totally different story. We went and we played this school up in Ohio called Anderson, okay? Anderson had a starting left tackle who had already committed to the university, or the Ohio State University, okay, as a sophomore. Dude was 6'8 and built like a grizzly bear. I got the tar beat out of me that whole game. I didn't stand a chance. I didn't feel bad about it after the game. That guy was made different, okay? Right? I'm a big boy. That guy made me look small. Okay? All I could do was my best. 
That was the standard. After the game, coach said, you couldn't have done much else. I know. That's why I don't feel bad. Okay? It felt like I was going up against the Hulk. Okay, but when it came to debate, I was the big dude. Right? If I lost, it's because I did something wrong. Or I made a mistake. Okay? There's a difference between failing and making a mistake. Or an error. An error means you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Failure means that you did everything the way you were supposed to, but something out of your control kept you from succeeding. That's what the true definitions are, if you study them out. Job didn't make any mistakes. Job didn't err in what he did every day. In fact, everything that you study about Job, Job did things the right way to God's standards. Job did not make an error. Job was constant. He was steady. He was complete or perfect. He didn't change based on the situations in his life. He was always the same. Now, in the eyes of God, that is not failure. That is success. Job had enough perspective to understand that God was God when he gave Job all those things, and God's still God when... God took them all away. Job knew that they weren't his in the first place. He knew that God just let him have them for a while. Was he heartbroken? Yes. Did he have to have ten funerals in one day for his children? Yes. But he was still appreciative for the time that he had what God blessed him with. He didn't get bitter that God took it away. Because he knew he wasn't entitled to any of it to begin with. That's a good man. But in the eyes of the world, Job was a failure because everything that he used to have was gone. Job made an error, is what they said. Go study it. Even his best friends that showed up, they're like, Job, surely you did something to make God angry. Surely you had to sin. And for 40 chapters of the book of Job, he's defending himself and correcting their ignorance. He's preaching right back to them saying, you guys know that I don't do things the way that other people do things. I haven't made one step out of line, but yet the world still considered him a failure. The world thinks that failure and error are synonymous. That's not true. Let me ask you a question. You guys remember a fellow by the name of Bernie Madoff, a company called Enron? Yeah. Bernie Madoff, criminal. Okay, Enron, Ponzi scheme. But do you think the people that worked as the secretaries in that company knew what was going on? Do you think that even middle management knew what was going on? No, they were just doing their job the best that they could. So when the company goes under, does the lady that used to answer the calls and say, thank you for calling Enron, how can I transfer your call? You think that they considered her a failure? She showed up every day, she clocked in, she did her job the best that she could. Does that make her a failure? No. Something out of her control caused her to lose her job. Didn't have anything to do with what she did each and every day. All right, well, what the world doesn't understand is that this thing isn't in the control, this thing called life, isn't under the control of man. You can do everything right and things still end up wrong because you're not the only variable to the math equation. You can do everything right. But if there's something on the other side that somebody else or that the world or that society does wrong, it doesn't mean it's going to turn out the right way. You do know that a positive and a negative, if you multiply them, it always ends up negative. Nothing you can do about it. Doesn't matter how right you are sometimes. Things are still going to turn out wrong in the world in the eyes of society because... According to them, you didn't meet the criteria. You didn't live up to what you were supposed to do. Aren't you glad God doesn't see things that way? God's standard, his measuring stick, is what? Your best. We've heard that a lot this past week. God's standard is knowing what you're capable of doing and striving to fulfill it to the best of your ability. If you do that, you're more than a success in God's eyes. You're good. 
You do realize that the thing that people are pursuing, the verse that people often quote, well done thou good and faithful servant, that's what God desires out of you, is to be good. Well, one of the things that makes you good, one of the proofs that you are good in the eyes of God, found in verse number 22 of Proverbs 13, it says, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Now, hang on a second. That's a little bit different. I always thought inheritance went to the next generation. Yeah, but you gotta, you got to think about it. You may leave money. You may leave wisdom. You may leave possessions. You may leave a house or a residence. You may leave things to the next generation, but that doesn't mean that it's an inheritance. By definition, an inheritance is something that is passed down, but it's also something that the next generation is entitled to. Study it out. Nobody ever says that I'm going to leave an inheritance in the Bible. The people that are in the next generation show up and say, I wish to claim my inheritance. Okay, isn't that what the prodigal son said? I wish for my portion. Okay, wasn't that what Jacob and Esau fought over was an inheritance? Isaac wasn't looking for an inheritance. He already had it. It was his. He received it from his father. Okay, he wasn't looking to leave an inheritance. That would mean that he kept it the exact same way that he received it. Isaac received it and made it his own. By the grace of God, he, he strove to do what? Improve it. To make it more sure. To make sure that the next generation wouldn't have to solve the problems again that he already had to solve. Okay, think of it if you will. Okay, everybody's seen photos of Cinderella's castle down there at Disney World? Okay, you at least know that there's a giant castle that's not real in the middle of Florida. Okay. If that were a real castle, horrible design. You can get to it from any angle. Okay, if an army were marching against it, way too many ways to get to that castle. Okay, there's no moat. There might be ones underground that, you know, they hide stuff in during the day. But as far as everybody else is concerned, you can get to that castle from anywhere. That's how the park's laid out. Any which direction you want to get to. You can walk right up, you can walk through it. Nobody even stops you. There's no gates. There's no checkpoints. There are no walls that go around it. There's no battlements. Okay? The only thing that is attached to it that makes noise or anything, they shoot like two fireworks off of it, and one of them is supposed to be Tinkerbell. Okay? It just runs down a wire at night. Doesn't seem like it's ready to be defended. Poorly designed castle. Okay? Now, is it impressive? Is it get the point across? Yeah, it wasn't built to be a defensive fortification. Okay? It was built to be advertising. In fact, nowadays you can spend a night in it if you have enough money. Okay? Point is, the purpose of an inheritance is to make sure that it's more defended than when you received it to make sure that you've done all you can to make sure that what's valuable really does pass its way down through the generations. Now, ideally, an inheritance does have some monetary value to it. Okay, if you purpose, I mean, it, it's in the heart of every father, every mother, to give good, good gifts to their descendants, it says in the Bible. We desire to give good gifts to those that we love. We desire to show our appreciation, but also we desire to give unto them something that they will find valuable. We want them to appreciate it. Okay, you can spend a million dollars on something that looks ugly and give it to me. Doesn't mean I'm going to appreciate it. It's ugly. Chances are I'm going to go try and hawk it down at a pawn shop, get whatever I can for it. Does it mean that there's intrinsic value to it. There's a lot of stuff that the world spends money on that I think, why? 
Why? Y'all remember when all them people in Hollywood were getting them metal teeth with the diamonds in them? They called them grills. Why? You ever hear somebody try and talk with one of them things in? Why would you do that to yourself? Sound ignorant. Now, was it expensive? Yes. Did it have value? No. Not to most people. And inheritance is about improving the value of it. This verse says a good man doesn't just think about the next generation. He thinks about two generations down the road. He's safeguarding and says, even if my kids, the next generation, do the wrong thing, I want to make sure that this is so well guarded and we put so much effort into it that they can't destroy it in one generation, it'll still be around for the next generation. They say, even if they throw everything away, I want to make sure that the inheritance can still pass on to my grandkids. He says, we've got to make a way to ensure that even if somebody does make an error, that they do it the wrong way, there's still enough value here to last an extra generation. A good man is forward thinking. Doesn't the Bible say that where there is no vision, the people perish? If all you're thinking about is today, you are reactionary. Now granted, that's where we live, is in today, in the now. That's all that we have control over, is right now. I can't change anything about tomorrow until tomorrow gets here. But when it gets here, it's now. That's all that I can ever impact, is now. But when you do now what you think is best for tomorrow, or next week, or next month, when you give enough forethought to the idea that what I plant today will have fruit someday, you can ensure that it's not just the next generation, but the generation after that. That'll have things that you put in the ground, but they get to call their own. They're going to be the ones that harvest it. You guys do realize that's what savings bonds are that you can get for kids. Right? Mom just keeps finding them. She'll go through books and, oh, hey, somebody bought you this when you were three. I'm like, banks nowadays don't even cash them things. How do we get the money value for that? No, I'm not kidding. I went to my bank and they're like, no, we don't do savings bonds. I'm like, you're a bank, right? Like, what, what's going on here? Oh, you can go down to the post office. What are they going to do? Give me stamps? I want money, not stamps. But see, if you do the right thing today, a good man understands some fruit's going to come up next week. But if you plant right, you can make sure that some comes up next month and the year after and the year after than that. And even when you're gone, there's still going to be fruit coming up out of the ground that you put the seed into the ground. A good man understands that the things that make an inheritance valuable don't come from man. They come from God. A good man understands that man only adds the chance for things to go off of the rails. But see, God does all things well. You look at heroes in the Bible that people claim all of them messed up. None of them were perfect. You look at David. You look at Samson. You look at Saul. You look at Moses. Look at anybody in the Bible that people will often use as an example. None of them were perfect. Some of them didn't know that what they were doing is wrong. See, Noah. But afterwards, he realized he made a mistake. You say, Brother Jordan, we can try to be good. Yeah, we can try. And it is our struggle every day to wrestle against this flesh on whether or not we succeed in being good or we fail in being what God's standard was for us. But all said and done, if you plant today by God's promise on the word of God you will reap what you sow if you put good in the ground good's going to come out if you plant you allow others to come along some plant, some water God gives the increase 
And whether two generations from now know you did it or not, doesn't matter. And inheritance isn't about getting a, oh, I would like to give credit to this person. That person's off the stage. They're not there anymore. And inheritance is about catching the past and running with it as long as you can. And when you think you're about ready to head off the scene, what do you do? You pass it to somebody else. We think of an inheritance as staying within the family. Aren't you glad that God doesn't think that way? God grafted in a vine, Amen. into the true vine, yeah. so that people like us that weren't a part of the family could get in the family. Amen. Spiritually, when it comes to an inheritance, it doesn't matter who it is, as long as they've got the same one in them that I've got in me, they're eligible for me to hand it off to. To say, here, take this and run with it. Where'd this come from? Well, it, came, it traveled a whole long way to get to you, but what matters is it came from God. He's the one that gave it to me. He's the one that's given it to you. Now run as hard as you can, as long as you can. A good man makes sure that it's not just dependent on one person to carry on the legacy. How many times? It'd be very rare for a grandfather not to know their grandchildren. For the grandfather to be off the scene before the grandchildren came onto the scene. Okay? It's not unheard of, but it's very uncommon. Study your Bible in the New Testament on how God did things in the church. God didn't set up a hierarchy of, okay, the Apostle Paul is going to teach that guy, and then that guy is going to teach this guy, and that guy is going to teach the guy after that. No, there's this doctrine called discipleship. That means as long as you're qualified, you can receive the same training that anybody else receives. Doesn't mean that God's going to call you to do it, but you can be trained. You can be trained as a missionary. Doesn't mean that God's going to call you to be a missionary. But discipleship means, well, if there's nobody left around that knows how to be a missionary, who's going to train the next generation? We'll teach as many as want to learn. But putting good seed in the ground never came back with a bad result. Planting and saying, Lord, by faith, we're planting. You give the increase. Water the seeds that you want to come to fruition. And we'll give you the praise for it. Part of making sure that the second generation gets an inheritance is not taking the ideology that, oh, that's somebody else's job. I trained the people that I was supposed to train. That's good enough. I passed on everything that I had to the next generation. It's their responsibility. Hogwash. The Apostle Paul said, as long or with as much as in me is. You know what that means? As long as he was still drawing breath, as long as he could still write on a page, even though his handwriting had gotten very large in his old age, if anybody came by and said, hey, what can you tell me about Jesus? He said, as long as I can, I'm going to keep doing it. Doesn't matter that it may not be my job to go and tell them. A good man says, I'm going to train up the next generation, but just in case, I'm going to train up the generation after that too. You realize that it's harder to, change, to train the generation after you than it is the second one? Because you're training up the next generation while you're the one that's calling all the shots, making all the decisions. You're the one that's responsible for their well-being. And their... What happens by the time the second generation comes around? Well, there's this thing called retirement. There's this thing called people tend to slow down a little bit. And they have more what we would call free time, but to them it's just time. Be honest, do you think it's a better investment of your time in your retirement to be out on a boat fishing? Or you think it'd be a better investment of your time to instill a little bit of wisdom into the second generation? Doesn't matter that they've got people that are so-called teaching them or rearing them. Just give them a little bit of the inheritance. Put the goodness of God in them like somebody did to you. Other people worried about everything else going on in the world. 
Very few people are worried about the second generation. Again, if all you're focused on is today, which it seems like the world is right now, all they can think about is now, all the time. They're not worried about the next generation. They're not worried about the generation after the next generation. But if God blesses you with the opportunity, why not instill into the grandchildren, the second generation, or the people that may not even realize one of these days this thing's going to belong to them? Why not instill in them some of the things that were instilled in you? Do you think it's going to do any harm? No, because good things bring about good results. Don't shove it down their throat. That might cause a little bit of harm. But teach it to them like it's taught to you. Because one day, it may just be that they're going to remember having a conversation with grandma or grandpa or uncle or aunt or just one of their best friends. And how God used that person to put in them what they needed for a day further on down the road. A good man doesn't leave it to chance. He makes sure that the next, next generation still gets some of the goodness of God. They still get an inheritance. Even if this generation blows it, they've still got the truths and the golden blessings because of that as a result they've got something that's worth more than the whole world they've got more value from these truths and these principles than the world could ever hope to be able to give them that's why I didn't lose a wink of sleep over the election probably because I was on NyQuil at the time too it didn't hurt didn't sweat it Whichever way it came out. Y'all think I'm crazy. You've heard me say this before. I'm just simple enough to believe that I did what I was supposed to, be, to do. I did what I believe God wanted me to do. And if it went a different direction, it wasn't because of God. But God knew it was going to happen. God permitted it to happen. And because I did what I was supposed to, God was going to find me a haven or a space to where he'd take care of everything. Amen. See, I thought that about, I don't know, 14 years ago when I first started voting. I've had that mindset, mindset ever since. I'm going to vote for who I think God wants me to vote for. But the rest is in God's hands. You got other people worrying and you know, taking ulcer medication and Tums and everything else because they're so worried on how it's going to turn out. You can worry about who's in. I know who God is. Amen. I'll be okay. Yes. Amen. That's something that hadn't been handed down to many generations as part of an inheritance. They think whoever's in the White House makes all the difference. <laughs> I know who's in the throne room of heaven, who sits on a throne that's in the sides of the north. Amen. Whoever's in the White House doesn't impress me. In fact, I've seen people in the White House that went directly against what God said, and God still humble them. God bring about a situation to make them look ignorant. God's got it all in control. You know what I can handle? What I can do. Doesn't do me any good to worry about anything else. Okay, let's look at the last part of this verse, and then we'll be done. Does a good man leave an inheritance to his children's children? And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. You know what that means? It means that those that live sinfully, wickedly, they can lay up all the treasures they want to. They're not going to be around to partake in them. Right? I'll remind you. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Y'all also remember the first commandment that was given with promise? The children are to respect their parents, honor their father and mother, and as a result, what would happen? Their days would be long on the earth. You know what I find a lot of times? 
those that are given over to riotous living, those that have been consumed by sin in their daily choices, they don't live as long as people that were raised the right way, that respected their parents. That, very simple illustration. Don't teach your kids to look both ways before they cross the street and then we'll look at another family who taught their kids to look both ways before they cross the street. We'll see which kids live longer. Those that listen to their parents, that understand that other people have their best intentions in heart, that they respect them and they honor them for the fact that God gave them charge over their lives, they tend, right, on the authority of God's Word, to live longer than people that don't. You know why? Because God honors people and blesses people that give respect and honor where God says it's due. Same is also true for people that respect or people that disrespect God's man. I don't want to hang, out, hang around a crowd of people that are always running the man of God down. You know why? Because that person's liable to have a heart attack while they're driving a car, and if I'm in it, I may go down with them. I've seen it happen. I've seen people, not in this building, but in that building over there, say bold-faced lies about the man of God, leave the church, and then within a year they couldn't even remember who they, they were themselves because Alzheimer's had taken them so bad. Think I'm kidding? God takes it very serious when he says to honor somebody and you don't. Doesn't say to honor them for their personality or because you're best friends with them. It says that we esteem them highly for their workmanship, their position. Not because of who they are, but because of what God called them to do. Sinners don't do that. Sinners don't respect authority. Sinners are always about blazing their own trail. Well, you know what happens if you run out into the wilderness? Liable that you may not come back. And it doesn't matter how much value and riches that you've stored up. If you don't live long enough to partake in it, guess who gets it? The just. Mm -hmm. Amen. They take what you've got and they give it to other people. Because the sinner is all about themselves. They don't have a next generation. They're off trying to do what? Claim everything for themselves. I don't understand why people think when they follow people that are all about here's what I want, I want, I want that they think there's going to be anything left for them at the end. If you're chasing a hungry, hungry hippo there's not going to be anything left for you to eat. They don't have a next generation because they're only concerned with what? Themselves. But all the things that they did amass if they didn't eat it up God makes sure that it finds its way to the just. Or in other words, the good. You just focus on being good, and God will take care of the rest. You focus on taking those things that God's given to you and instilling them in other people. Not for your own glory, but for His glory. Then you season it with prayer and say, Lord, I pray that you do for that person what you did for me. I want to make sure that that generation that that generation of believers receives the same blessings that you blessed my generation with. And then you leave it in God's hands. Because that's all you can do with an inheritance anyway. You can plan and, you know, come up with the best laid strategies that you want. But here's the thing. Once you're off the scene, you don't have any more say in what, how it's handled. Amen. You can put it in a trust fund, but eventually one day's coming where it all belongs to them. And it doesn't matter how you wanted it to be used, it's going to be up to them. Instead of worrying about making sure that it lasts, just deal with the people that are going to receive it and try to make sure that like the generation before you and hopefully the generation you're in, teach them that the important thing is about being good. Not about having great possessions. Not about comparing yourselves to others. But being good for Christ's sake. Because it's only by His goodness that we are what we are. It's only by grace, which is defined as God's riches as Christ's expense, only by grace that we aren't in a gutter somewhere right now. That we aren't in the cesspools of this world. But no, we're in our right mind 
in the house of God on a Sunday morning being edified and being encouraged to what? Remain good and to put that goodness into not just the next generation but the generation after that. Safeguard the things of God. Make sure that even if the next generation does mess up there's a generation behind them that already know the right way to do it. It's never a bad idea to have a backup. And it's never a bad idea to assume that people are going to be people. And because people are people, it might be worth just doing the work now. Making sure that it's done right. So that the next gen, they may not have to worry about it. Or the generation after that, they don't have to worry about whether or not they received the right thing because they were taught it the same way that the people before them were taught it. You know why all of that happens in verse number 22? Because somebody was good. The rest of the verse in the second generation, having an inheritance, that doesn't happen unless somebody's good. You know what we heard about all week during the revival? The importance of getting back to good. Our best. Pursuing the things that God said are not just important, but they're imperative. And you know what we ought to do with that goodness? Instill it in other people. Invest in people. You say, well, what if we never get the return on the investment? Doesn't matter. All that matters is that God gets the return on the investment. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.